Praise the Lord. So thankful that you joined us this evening. Uh, this is replacing our in-person meeting. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about God's chosen fast. I'm going to head in the Bible to Isaiah chapter 58 verse 3 and uh, we're going to spend some time in Isaiah 58 today and just go scripture by scripture, line by line. Uh, it really, this is a great uh, passage of scripture concerning fasting, which is a Christian discipline that all Christians must learn how to do and uh, be effective in. So Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 3 says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they. This is the children of Israel speaking, or Isaiah speaking, um, uh, for, for the children of Israel. He's saying, they say, uh, we fasted and you see not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge of what we've done. So Isaiah is making this point that even though they were fasting and they were faithful in their fasting, they felt like it was ineffective and that God was not recognizing their fast. So we're going to talk about what fasting is. Uh, we're going to talk about what fasting is not. And we're also going to talk about uh, God's opinion of fasting and um, what is God's chosen fast today. You probably have heard of fasting or have uh, at some point done it. Maybe you were instructed to do it by a doctor. You had a procedure coming, something like that, and you had to take some time. Maybe you had to fast breakfast or lunch. Uh, many people have uh, learned to fast, and in fact, it's become uh, something that many health healthy people do in order to uh, become healthy, and it helps to kind of cleanse their bodies. 
So we're not talking today, though, about a physical fast where we're just trying to do it for health reasons. We're talking about a fast that we're doing in order to do it for spiritual reasons and as consecration to the Lord. I think the best um, definition of fasting, best way to see fasting is from that second line in Isaiah 58 and 3, where it says, wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Now that sounds pretty intense, but certainly that is a good description of fasting. Uh, in the laws of the scripture, in the laws about fasting, this line, afflicted our soul, is repeated over and over again. Leviticus 16, 29, 16, 31, 23, 27, 23, 32, and even Numbers 29 and 7 all use this description of fasting as the affliction of our soul. It really became almost a technical expression to understand what fasting really is. The affliction of this of our soul, this phrase expresses what is um, the spiritual value in the act of fasting. Uh, it is the repression of sensual impulses through abstinence. Uh, and it reflected in affliction, almost like harm being done, because that's how it feels to the flesh. Because what we're doing is we are repressing our sensual impulses, the desires of the flesh, the acts of the flesh, the works of the flesh. We are repressing them. We are holding them down through abstinence by not doing certain things. Um, basically, what fasting is, it is denying ourselves. It's denying our flesh, denying our carnal nature. Jesus said that not only is denying our flesh um, essential to being uh, a, a good minister or to being a preacher or anything like that, but anybody who desired to walk after him would need to do it. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The denying of our flesh and carnal nature is inherent in the Christian faith. You cannot be a Christian and not exercise this discipline of denying your flesh. That's what fasting is. Fasting is the denying of our flesh. And you can fast anything where, again, maybe if you're doing it for health reasons, you would fast food. Food is certainly one of the primary means of fasting in a spiritual sense. But you can fast anything at all as long as it is denying your flesh because that's ultimately what it is. It is an act to deny the desires and sometimes even the needs of the flesh. One definition of fasting is defrauding our appetites. Defrauding our appetites. Causing our appetites to basically be diminished. Fasting is much like dieting. Now some diets you may go on, you may intend on uh, doing this long term. Really, that's not a diet. That's just a, a life change, which is an, a, a great thing to do. But dieting typically has a short term to it. It is a commitment to changing your eating habits for a short while in order to curve your appetite, it, in order to defraud your appetite, if you will. What your, your hope is, is if I force myself to eat only particular things for a short while, when I'm done with the diet, I can then uh, control my cravings easier. I can curb my appetite. I can make myself eat less and eat things that are healthy for me. That's the same principle behind fasting. What I'm doing is I'm neglecting my body for a period of time and I'm doing it with the expectation that when that period of time is over, 
I will be able to control my desires and my passions better. I'll be able to curve my appetite to where I don't desire things that will fill this flesh as much, but I will desire things that will fulfill the spirit of God. So this idea uh, is that we're not fasting sin. Sin doesn't need to be fasted. It needs to be repented of or turned away from. We're not fasting sinful activities or wicked activities. Those things need to be repented of. We need to put our backs toward it and walk the opposite way. So we're not talking about, you know, okay, we're going to go a time without pride or we're going to go a time without lust. Those things are sin. What we're talking about is going a time uh, not doing things that are needed or wanted by the flesh, but aren't necessarily sinful activity. Again, eating food in itself is not a sinful activity. It's a necessity. Um, you know, maybe even some amount of entertainment or rest, wanting to sit down and watch a movie. Maybe that's not a sin. It may not be beneficial to your spirit, but it's not necessarily a sin, of course, depending on what you're watching. Um, so, but it's not a sin to sit down and watch a movie. However, that can become an obsession. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to remove the things that are harmful in excess, not necessarily the things that are sinful in themselves, but if they become an overwhelming habit or addiction, then I need to, to remove it out of my life. I need to diminish it and I need to be able to control the appetite I have for it. Ultimately, what I'm trying to do is reserve my life uh, and my habits and my actions down to only things that contribute to a consecrated lifestyle. That's why we have uh, weekly fasting. So there's two types of fast. Um, is first of all a weekly fast. This is again the, uh, the the mindset of afflicting our soul. We're trying to uh, hold back our appetites. We're trying to remind ourselves that I am not uh, a part of this world. I am part of the kingdom of God. I do not desire to take part of only fleshly activity. I want to take part of spiritual activity. I'm going to curve my appetite. Appetite. I'm going to defraud my appetite. So I'm going to live a consecrated lifestyle by fasting once a week. I encourage every Christian to pick a day that you will fast, uh, whether it be fasting fully, a full day of food, uh, maybe only fasting a couple meals, maybe uh, other things. Uh, but certainly you need to take at least one day a week to fast. I also encourage you to be prayerful about taking extended fast. Uh, we know Jesus was led by God into the wilderness for a 40-day fast. Now, I've not been able to do a 40-day fast. I don't suggest you trying to do a 40-day fast unless you really, really feel that that is God speaking to you to do that. But the interesting point is that Jesus was led into the wilderness to fast. Extended fast should be led by the Spirit of God. If you feel like God is leading you to a three-day fast or a, a week-long fast, that is absolutely an incredible thing. I encourage you to do it, but you should wait until you are being led by God to enter into that. Uh, so Psalms 35 and 13, it says, But as for me, when they were sick, my friends were sick, I clothed myself in sackcloth and I fasted, first of all. Um, so we're going to talk about what fasting does for us and for those around us in a minute. But he's, he makes this point, I humbled my soul with fasting. It's the same idea behind afflicting my soul. Fasting is about bringing my life under submission to God and saying, God, whatever is in my life that you don't want to be there, I give it to you. Whatever uh, is there, 
whatever it is there that you uh, want me to have, I, I give that to you. Everything uh, in me, I give it to you. I humble myself through fasting and I bring myself under submission to the Lord by denying my needs and my wants for a period of time. So that's essentially an overview of fasting in general, but let's talk about uh, the correct way to fast. Uh, specifically, let's go through Isaiah 58. There are just some excellent tips on ways not to fast, and we'll talk about um, other ways to fast in a minute, but specifically ways not to fast. We already read Isaiah 58 and 3, but I'll read it again. It says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. So they were fasting, they were afflicting their soul, at least in their own opinion, they were afflicting their souls, but God was not recognizing their fast. Why didn't God recognize their fast? Well, the reason is because their fasting had become mechanical. It had become mechanical. Now, what does that mean that it became mechanical? Well, they, in the Old Testament, fasting was often done in uh, ordained days by God. They were ordained by God to fast those days. These were uh, uh, celebrations and, and times where all of the children of Israel would come together and fast. They would fast certain things and in certain ways. So when Isaiah 58 is talking about fasting, he's talking specifically about those times and the other times, but specifically about those times where it was a congregational fast. So the problem with that is that uh, through time, it became very repetitive. Everybody knew what was going to happen. Everybody knew what was expected of them. It was no longer fresh, nor was it um, able to really bring victory in their lives because it became mechanical, repetitive. They were able to do it easily. Uh, it was done almost out of a habit or an obligation to God rather than it being a time of seeking Jehovah and sacrificing to him. Now, this is something that we must retain in our walk with God. It is a fresh passion and zeal to seek God and to fast and consecrate ourselves, afflict our souls in order to, uh, again, consecrate ourselves to God. So this isn't supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be repetitive. It's not supposed to be life as normal. Fasting, um, in the very definition of what it is and what it means and what it does for us, should not mean life as normal. If you wake up on a day that you're fasting and it's just like, okay, well, just another normal day, then you're not doing it correctly. So what does that really mean? So if I do not normally eat breakfast, for example, now I do, I do eat breakfast. I've learned that it's an important part of my day. But if you don't normally eat breakfast, then God's not necessarily going to recognize your fasting breakfast as a true fast because that's just your day that's just you know your business as usual uh, my father tells the story of a young man that came to him and he was all excited and said I, I fasted this week I fasted this particular day this week my dad said oh that's that's wonderful you know so how did it go he said well you know I I fasted between breakfast and lunch. I didn't eat a single thing between breakfast and lunch. Well, to him, he seemed very excited. Maybe it did something for him. But typically, you don't eat before, during breakfast and lunch on a normal day. So it's not a fast for you not to eat breakfast between breakfast and lunch on your fast day. So if it's mechanical, and it's not really a cost to you or a sacrifice to you, then more than likely it is not being effective in afflicting your soul and curving your appetites 
that is a requirement to fasting that it be difficult, that it be, um, again, an, an, the opposite of what you normally would do on a given day. Uh, verse number th uh, three, it continues, and it says, Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. So what he's saying is, he's saying that even though you've fasted particular things and in a particular way, you're still going out of your way to find pleasure on that fast day. Now, you know, I hate to, to deny anybody pleasure, but the fact is fasting is not meant to be pleasurable. Uh, so what I, I uh, would see and what I've even done myself, I've had to learn is that if I'm taking a day to fast food and I've chosen this day to spend as a day of fasting to God, I probably shouldn't go, you know, watch TV all day. Um, probably shouldn't be on social media all day. So what we often do is we replace one thing with another thing. Okay, well, I'm not going to eat today, but I'm going to sit here and, and enjoy myself by watching this program or spending time on this social media site. That is replacing one pleasure with another. You're not afflicting your soul. So he's saying your fast day is filled with pleasure. It's not supposed to be that way. He also says you fill your fast day with labor. You continue to work. And focus on your own lives, your own finances, your own needs, rather than consecrate yourself to Jehovah. Now, I'm not naive to think that we all can take a day off every week to fast. Certainly, we're going to have to work and we're going to have to uh, be faithful on our jobs, even when we're fasting. But the idea is that that's where their mind and their heart was at. They were not taking time in consecration to the Lord. Their focus was purely on their job or, you know, again, they just never slowed down. Their heart and mind were focused on that. Now, I'll be honest with you. This is where I fail sometimes fasting. I fall into this trip trap. I've learned about myself that my fast day often becomes my most productive day. Because, you know, I'm not eating, so I'm not spending time eating meals. I'm not spending time, you know, maybe uh, watching things or spending time on social media. So I replace that with work. Let me just t take this time to really get a lot done. But again, that's not what fasting is about. Fasting must be a time of holy obeisance to God. A time of prayer and meditation on God. If it is not, then again, we're going to fail in what we're doing. Uh, Jesus in the wilderness is a perfect example of fasting. He had to remove himself from everyday life and go to a place of fasting in the wilderness and escape from everyone and everything. We also, when we fast, it needs to be, that needs to be our mindset. We got to go into a wilderness. We got to go to a place of isolation where it's just me and God in prayer, reading the Bible. And again, I, I recognize we can't always just completely remove ourselves from the world, but we can mentally and spiritually remove ourselves and take time to meditate on the Lord. Verse four, Isaiah 58 and four says, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wicked wickedness. Now, I don't know about you, but fasting brings out the beast in me. <laughs> I have a very hard time being kind and considerate to other people when I'm fasting. Fasting tends to magnify our feelings and emotions. In fact, you're going to feel very isolated, isolated and alone. You're going to feel like everything, uh, I, I'll often, especially in a, an extended fast, the first couple days, I feel horrible. I feel angry and upset. I feel like my life is falling apart. Um, it's just because that's just the nature of fasting. It brings those things out, uproots them so that God can remove them out of you. Often fasting magnifies just what's already there. 
hidden under the surface so that God can remove them. One commentary said this, their fasting increased their self-preference and excited them to fierce controversies or bitter resentment. Now, fasting done right causes us to become humble and submitted to God and our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Fasting done wrong has the opposite effect. It causes us to prefer ourself or to exalt ourself. It causes us to resent our brother and our sister. When we are doing fasting wrong, again, you start to look at yourself and say, well, look at me, look at what I'm willing to do. Why aren't they willing to do that? Look at my strength in fasting. Why don't they have that strength as well? In this passage of scripture, it's specifically uh, talking about these uh, those who were looking down on the poor. They were expecting them to have the same amount of consecration and commitment to God, but they just were not able to by the nature of being poor. And it said, well, you can't look down on people, resent them, have hard feelings toward them, smite them with your fist of wickedness, saying you're just destroying your own fast. So I have to be careful in fasting that I keep my spirit right, that fasting be about me and not about everybody else. It be about me consecrating to God and not about what other people are or are not doing to God. Fasting done wrong magnifies pride and causes us to look down on others. We have to intentionally be careful to make sure our fasting is about submitting ourselves to God and to our brothers and sisters. Verse 4 continues, you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Essentially what he's saying uh, is that you're fasting wrong. This is the wrong way to fast. God will not bless this fast. God will not hear your voice, although you raise it on high. God will not bless a fast that is mechanical, pleasurable, laborious, or productive in the flesh, or that is prideful. God will not bless that fast. We have to be intentional about making sure our fast is not mechanical, pleasurable, uh, laborious, or prosperous in the flesh, or prideful, or productive in the flesh, or prideful. Verse 5, he continues, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? In verse 3, Isaiah speaking from the voice of the people, asking God questions, asking him, have, he, have they not recognized, has he not recognized the affliction of their soul? Uh, they said specifically, wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge of it? But now Isaiah's flipped the script and he's speaking as God. In verse five, he's meant, meaning to reflect their original question by saying, is it not the fast that I have chosen? This isn't it. This, you say this is the affliction of your soul, but I'm not seeing it that way. In other words, is this really the way you afflict your soul? He goes on to ask more questions. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? So God's putting an emphasis on this and saying, you're doing it not for me, but for yourself and for those who are around you. We cannot allow our fast to become about anything more than God and consecrating our life to God. God is speaking in regards to their outward gesture, their posture and signs of penitence that they were showing. Obviously, they were showing these things in order to uh, get the approval of other people. Of course, Jesus spoke on that in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16. He says, moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites are of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their face 
that they may appear unto men to fast. So first of all, he says, be truthful about your fast. Don't pretend to fast when you're not. Don't pretend to have a fasting life when you don't have a fasting life or consecrated life. He says, and, and also don't make it look like you're fasting when you're not. Don't make it look like you're having a hard time. Verily I say unto you, he says, they have their reward. He says, if you're fasting in order to get the um, attention of other people, then you're going to get that. If that's your motivation behind fasting, you're going to get your reward. God's not going to stop you from getting recognized, but your, your fasting is going to be in vain and it's not going to be beneficial or fruitful. Because ultimately, we've got to fast to the Lord. We've got to do it as consecration to Him and not uh, in the eyes of other people or for the approval of other people. Because that may be an, a reward, but that's very short-lived. Who cares if other people see that you're fasting and think that you're a great man or woman of God if you're not a great man or woman of God and you don't have a life of consecration? Verse 17 of Matthew 6, he continues, But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, wash your face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. When I fast, not for my brother or my sister's attention or their approval, but I do it in secret. I do it, Lord, where I don't, you know, expose myself, but only unto God. Then the Bible says he will reward me openly. Now, that is a perfect, uh, uh, a perfect example of that. As somebody who's always saying, oh, man, I'm so hungry. Oh, I'm just... Now, I'm fasting right now, and I'm having such a hard time. Oh, please pray for me. I'm trying to fast, but this is tough. I've been fasting for two, three days now, and I, I just, man, this is difficult. Don't complain when you're fasting. Never complain. Try very carefully to make sure you're not complaining. You're not telling other people or making it known you're fasting, but do it in secret and God will reward you openly. Verse 5, Isaiah 58 and 5, he continues, Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? He's saying basically what you consider a fast, in God's eyes it is not. He's saying, God, as God, I will not honor or accept hypocritical fasting. God will not honor it or accept it when we are hypocritical and not truthful when we fast. Now, uh, in this passage of scripture, Isaiah 58, in verse 6, Isaiah flips it again. He's not talking about what fasting isn't, but he begins to talk about what fasting is. And, and truly, he begins to talk about what fasting does. <clears throat> He says in verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen? God is, he's using this as an introduction to the words of God. That word chosen means to try or select. It also means favored by God. So he's saying, listen, I'm about to explain to you the fast that I've chosen that is favored by God. This should happen when you fast. If these things are not happening, then, then you're doing it wrong. You've got to try to consecrate yourself a little differently or perhaps more than what you've done uh, previously. He continues in verse 6, fasting is going to loose the bands of the wickedness. My chosen fast, it loosens the bands of the wickedness. It undoes the heavy burdens. Oh, praise God. It allows the oppressed to go free and it breaks every yoke. This means that that phrase, bands of wickedness, it means to be loosed from a bad or perverse moral character. To undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, means to be set free from afflictions and injustices caused by wickedness. Hallelujah. When I fast, God's able to break the chains of addiction. 
when I fast, God's able to rewire my brain and remove my false pretenses and false ideas on how I should live and act and all of that, God rewires it. It's just like in Romans 12, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds. By fasting, we are renewing our minds in God and he transforms the way we think, the way we feel. And I know that that this may seem contrary to the other, but fasting, which may be hard and difficult, painful at times, fasting brings freedom. Oh, praise God. Fasting brings freedom and liberty in the flesh. True fasting, it will provide you with a new sense of liberty and freedom in your life to serve God. Fasting can cause those who have been crushed in pieces those who have been bruised, those who have been broken, those who are discouraged, those who are oppressed to be set free in the name of Jesus. That's the power of fasting. Praise God. Isaiah 58 and 7, it also says, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide thyself from thine own flesh. Basically, what he's saying is fasting gives us sympathy towards those who are less fortunate than us. It gives us sympathy to those who are in the middle of hardships. Fasting will force you to go out of your way to care for somebody. Why? Because now you're feeling pain. And you can relate to their pain. Now you're feeling want. And you can relate to their want. Fasting ultimately makes us better human beings. Better contributors to the world and the people who are around us. Fasting helps us to be better in all that we do. Because now we can relate and we're sympathetic toward those who are in pain and who are in want. That's the power of fasting. <clears throat> Verse 8, he even gives even just greater promises. He says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Hallelujah. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. The image here is that such prosperity would come on the people like the spreading light of the morning. He says, thine health shall spring forth speedily, meaning thy healing will spread forth speedily. It's going to come on you quickly. So he's saying, he's promising you physical, mental, and emotional health when you fast. That's the power of fasting. He also says, thy righteousness shall go before thee. Your spiritual health will be blessed. You'll be righteous. You'll be able to walk in the righteousness and holiness of God. So not only does he touch your physical, emotional, mental health, but he also gives you spiritual health. And then to close, he says in verse 8, he concludes verse 8 with this, The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. He's, he's connecting this back to the book of Exodus when the children of Israel was coming out of Egypt. And, and this is one commentary said this about it. The angels were to secure and cover the rear of God's army. Thus the angel of his presence secured the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. Exodus 14, 19, it explains this further. It says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed himself from being in front and went behind. He went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. So here's what I believe God's trying to say. This is what Isaiah was communicating. When you fast, you gain the favor of God. And God 
starts to back you up. When he says your re reward, he's saying God is going to back up what you do. When you walk into a store, guess what? God's backing you up. When you're facing the attack of the devil, God backs you up. When you're facing physical uh health issues, God is backing you up. When you get up behind that pulpit, God's going to back you up. When you cast that demon possessed boy, that demon out of that demon possessed boy, God's going to back you up. That's what fasting does. It gives us favor in the presence of God and God backs us up. Oh, I feel Jesus right now speaking to some people. If you want the favor of God, then we've got to begin to live a life that is consecrated through fasting unto the Lord. Can we pray right now? Can you find a place right now just to talk to God for a moment as this final song plays? Oh, let us Ah. Uh -huh. 
there's no other life for me, God. It's you and you alone. It's plain and now I see I've nowhere else to go. This is my one desire that you'd allow me to be used by you.